All right, so welcome to your Thursday evening dose of astronomy. I'm Irene Pease with the Amateur Astronomers Association of New York, and uh, this is our little tour of the local solar system for Thursdays. So tonight I'll be using too many things. I think I'm finally going to break my computer uh, with all the stuff I'm going to try to show, and won't that be fun? Um, the main programs that I'll be using are Open Space, which you can find at openspaceproject.com. So the website is there and in the description. And uh, you can download it for free. It's freeware. You can kind of use it to uh, like fly around the, the universe. Uh, tonight we're just going to stick with kind of local solar system. Uh, but yeah, so we'll see a little bit more of that uh, a little later um, when we look at... Uh, our local solar system. So to start things off, I like to start with Stellarium and just kind of take a look at uh, what's up in the sky. So Stellarium you can find, uh, stellarium.org, um, some really good software for just visualizing what's up in the night sky, which is what we're going to look at. So I think I have things set. Um, yeah, that looks about right. So let's turn over to Stellarium. And as usual, we like to start with now, um, somewhere I have a clock, so we can pull that up. Um, yep, just after eight, still pretty light out. And uh, yeah, looking over towards the west at that, oh, that tree. Um, the sun working on setting, so its label is still up at least. I guess it's actually below the horizon. But uh, last week, I think I had tried to introduce some comets, and so I suggested that you look for some constellations where comets will be appearing over the next couple weeks. So hopefully you've had a chance to find some of those, because tonight we're going to look at the comets. And there's one other exciting thing that's happening that I'll mention um, for all y'all New Yorkers, um, if I won't forget about that. But yeah, so starting off with comets, we have two comets that we're anticipating this month. Uh, both will be in the evening eventually. One is currently out in the morning and soon, in just a couple days, by early next week, you should be able to catch it in the evening. So uh, looking over kind of towards the southwest part of the sky, uh, last week I said we wanted to you know, follow the arc of the handle of the dipper to Arcturus and then speed on to Spica. So kind of uh, between the constellation that Spica is in, which is Virgo, uh, so between uh, Virgo and Leo, um, we're going to have a comet kind of sailing through there. So let me get, I guess, a little darker. We'll go to 10 o'clock. Yeah, that's good and dark. And hopefully it's not too low. Find out in a minute. So two comets. The first one we're going to look at is, again, it's going to be towards this part of the sky in sort of the southwest. And that one has already been visible. If you're in the southern hemisphere, you may have had a chance to catch it already. Uh, that's going to be Comet Lemon. Um, so a lot of these are named after uh, a survey or wherever they were found. So this isn't lemon like the fruit. This is lemon as in Mount Lemon in Arizona, just outside of Tucson, um, where I used to go sledding in the winter because there's no, there's no snow in town. So you had to like go up a mountain. And my friends always invited me to go sledding, side note, because I actually had a sled. So they'd be like, hey, Irene, want to go sledding? And I'd be like, no, but yes, you can borrow my sled. Um, anywho, yeah, so Comet Lemon, um, not real bright yet. So I'm not sure. We don't always know exactly how bright things are going to be in advance. It's always like kind of a little bit of a mystery, so hard to predict. But this is showing the location of Comet Lemon for tonight. We don't really see a whole lot there. Um, but let's just go ahead and maybe turn on some constellation lines so we can have those as markers and get a sense of where it's going to be headed. Um, I think I said it was going to head up kind of between uh, Virgo and Leo um, over the course of the next month or so. Um, ooh, there it goes. Um, may actually be getting a little bit fainter. So if you haven't had a chance to see it, I'm not sure it's going to happen. Um, exciting. If you have a telescope, really high power telescope, it is going to be going... Um, as we saw just right through this region we looked at a few months ago or a few weeks ago um, between Leo and Virgo where there's a whole mess of galaxies. So that was going to be part of my comet or not story, um, which I think I have time for. If we, uh, 
you know, we've explored some of the galaxies in here. If I turn on our uh, deep sky object markers, whoa, All right? So the blinking red lines, that's still our, our comet. We can zoom in there, see maybe a bright nucleus. Okay, so here's a comet among a bunch of things that are not comets. So that's the whole, you know, comet or not. Get it. Um, yeah, <laughs> so uh, a lot of these brighter galaxies, if you look at their numbers or their designations, oh, lost galaxy, that's awkward. Um, they have these M, so there's like M90, there's M49, move out a little bit. Um, the brightest one have these, have these M numbers. So M stands for Messier, as in Charles Messier. So he was a French astronomer that lived oh, a little while back in you know, somewhere in France, I guess. Um, I usually say Paris, but I don't actually know that for sure. So fact check that. Um, but he had a, you know, a smaller telescope uh, than most amateur astronomers have today. But he would scan the skies and look for comets because comets were like a really bad omen. So like now we're all like, oh, sweet, a comet. Let's go check it out. But back in the day, people, you know, were like superstitious about them, weren't really sure what they were. Um, and, uh, and so they wanted to know if there was a comet coming. They couldn't do anything about it, but they just wanted to know in advance. So Charles Messier would scan the sky and look for these fuzzy spots because the comet just looks like a fuzzy spot in the sky, um, but it would move. So if I go back and, and find it again, go back to our lemon, lemon like the mountain, not the anyway, fruit. Um, he would, uh, so he would track all these things that were fuzzy spots. Uh, and if it moved like a comet, so like I think you saw before a comet, is going to move against the backdrop of stars. I'm going to turn that off. Um, so from night to night, oh, satellite. Uh, from night to night, it it moves a bit, right? It doesn't just stay in one spot. It moves quite a bit, um, as opposed to these other fuzzy spots that didn't move. So he cataloged all the fuzzy spots that didn't move, so that other comet hunters wouldn't waste their time like waiting to see if they moved. At least that's how I like to tell the story. Anyway, it's now like a list of, you know, 110-ish uh, bright objects that amateur astronomers like to look at in their telescopes or binoculars or both. So, yeah. So that's Comet Lemon. See if you can check that one out. The other one, oh, we're kind of seeing it over here. I think that's it. Uh, Neowise. So, as you can see, it's, it's actually, whew, there you can actually see a fuzzy spot. Um, so this one's a bit brighter so far. And yes, this will be out in the evening. So this is looking at early next week. Um, I wanted to start with what's happening in the morning. Uh, so it has been out in the morning. So let's kind of turn around and look at the eastern sky. East is over here. <laughs> so if you're out in the morning, um, like I actually managed to get out this morning, bright and early. Yeah, morning. Um, and, uh, you could see it. We had, you know, a couple planets out there. We had the moon out there and then just rising before the sun was this little smudge with a bright core. So that's kind of what it looked like. <laughs> uh, it wasn't quite that bright in my Brooklyn sky, uh, but could definitely see a bit more detail in binoculars. And as the, the image shows here, something interesting about comets is they have two separate tails, right? So you can tell the direction of the sun because you know where the sun is going to be rising. Um, but you have kind of a like this bluish hue to one tail and then not as blue on the other one. Um, so I think Chris had mentioned something about these uh, last week. Uh, so the two different tails generally point away from the sun, um, but the this longer one that's the dust or sorry that's the ion trail or sometimes it's called the gas trail um, that has very very light gas particles basically like literally just atoms or no not atoms they're molecules um, of ionized gas that have been blasted off of the comet um, so since those are so light they get and they have a, a charge to them because they're ions they have a positive charge so they're uh, directed exactly away from the sun as the solar wind is, is blasting them off, it reacts with the sun's magnetic field. I'm going to wave my hands and say magnetism. So that's always exactly away from the sun. Then this dust tail, 
uh, points generally away from the sun, but not exactly away from the sun. So that stuff has a little bit more mass. Um, so as it's running into the solar wind going in one direction, it's kind of like a, like a, there's, there's more resistance. So it kind of gets bent off um, away from the direction that the, the comet is headed. So in general, away from the sun, but not exactly away from the sun. Um, so two different tails. So if you can see, I don't, I don't know if you may have seen some pictures already of, uh, of Neowise. There's been some nice ones circulating in our organization, um, in our group. So that's been a lot of fun to track. So morning, right? It's been a morning thing. But you have to get up early before the sun comes up and uh, kind of washes that out. But if we wait a couple nights, so yeah, let's go to early next week. Um, say the 14th, um, you don't have to get up as early. Let me just go ahead and uh, pause time here. Um, so, um, yeah, so one, you don't have to get up as early. Um, it'll be, you know, darker later-ish. But the other thing is as it's moving, it's moving more towards the north. So if I kind of backtrack a few days, yeah, okay, so it was, it was over, you know, right below um, this constellation Auriga. So bright star Capella, it was basically below that this morning. Um, but over the next few days, it's, it's just moving towards the north. And there, if things are far enough north, if they're close enough to the north celestial pole where the north star is, then they don't really set. So if we kind of backtrack through the evening, see Neo Wise doesn't get too far below the horizon. So it kind of skims the horizon. So it'll be out low in the horizon in the Northwest in the evening. And then it'll be low on the horizon in the Northeast in the morning. So you get two chances to see it. If you want to stay up late, you can stay up late and look for it. Or if you want to get up early, you can get up early and look for it either way. Uh, I think most astronomers are more prone to stay up late <laughs> to look for something rather than getting up early. But you know, everyone has different preferences. So those are the comets, uh, Lemon and Neowise. Uh, hope you get a chance to check those out. This one, especially Neowise has been like really great so far. So um, yeah, so there's your comets in Stellarium. So let's hop on over to <clears throat> open space, <laughs> which uh, has been, um, it's my, my, my computer's been wrestling with it today. <laughs> so open space, uh, kind of what it sounds like, it, again, it's open source software, and you can load all kinds of data into it. So we can load the stars and galaxies and quasars and asteroids and in theory comets um, but when I started loading in we have a couple different comet sets that that I wanted to show but I thought I could get two of them in here but they all started breaking my computer um, and one of them worked about half an hour ago <laughs> not working now so that's okay um, so we're gonna move out away from the earth um, let me turn the orbits of the planets back on so we can see uh, what's happening with comets. Why are comets so cool? Like one, they're they're really pretty just to see in our sky. It's something different. We usually get like one or two a year. Some are better than others. Not very many are like that clear to the unaided eye. Like most of them you need binoculars or telescopes. So that's why people are pretty excited about um, this one that, uh, that you can see without binoculars or telescopes. Just look outside and if you know where to look. Um, and I'll show you another thing that'll help you uh, find it. Um, if you know where to look, then, then you can see it. It's pretty, pretty nifty. Um, so a lot of the comets, they're coming from pretty far out in the solar system. We look at the orbits of the planets and they look pretty round. They're not circular, they're elliptical, but, um, but, uh, but comets tend to have more, much more highly elliptical orbits. <laughs> So I'm going to show you <laughs> where some of the comets are coming from um, and it's basically going to freeze everything. <laughs> um, I don't know if it's a Mac issue or if it's my computer or just I'm running like 15 things right now. So um, all right, so this should be far enough out. 
freeze that and make sure time's not running so it won't actually crash the system. It'll just freeze everything. Um, right. So out past Neptune's orbit, right? So we're seeing like uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, right? And then the inner planets are way, way in there somewhere. Um, we have this group of objects uh, called trans-Neptunian objects, which is exactly what it sounds like. They're past Neptune. So trans-Neptunian. Um, these are basically the Kuiper belt objects. So there are some small bodies that are far out in the solar system. Yeah, okay, so I'm not even going to try and move it, but I'll point. <laughs> so you can still kind of see there's Neptune's orbit. It's a little bit darker blue. <laughs> there's my umbrella. Um, and then there's this whole mess of objects. Um, so this are, these are actually cataloged objects, which is just amazing that we've been able to detect them because they're far away. They're really faint. They're not super bright. Uh, they're very small, but you can see most of them are fairly well behaved, just kind of staying in that orbit out past Neptune in what we call the Kuiper belts, another group of kind of asteroid-like objects out past Neptune. But we also have these uh, other <laughs> more hairy kind of like, <laughs> it's like, you know, my hair when I wake up in the morning, like some of it's okay and then some of it's like sticking up in all directions. Um, Right? So we have a few of those that go in really close to the sun and swing back out. So those are the highly elliptical orbits um, where these kind of rocky, icy bodies get closer to the sun. And so when they get closer to the sun, their, their ices melt. And remember, ices aren't necessarily water ice, but we have other types of uh, other volatiles, other like gases and things that are frozen in the very, very cold outer solar system um, and they vaporize. Um, and get blasted off of the comet along with some of the comet dust. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of where some of the comets come from. Longer period comets that come frequently, but maybe every several hundred years instead of like every 20 years, um, those might come from even further out in another group of objects that we call the Oort cloud. Um, and there is a way for me to show kind of where those are. Oh, sweet. It turned off without dying. Um, so I can just show <laughs> um, kind of a grid. Uh, we haven't actually found any specific objects because these, um, these are so much further out. Um, so we're pulling away. You remember where the, the, that Kuiper belt, the trans-Neptunian objects were? So this, uh, this wire frame, this kind of grid is out at the distance that we think there's another group of objects that we call the Oort cloud. We haven't directly detected them, which is part of the reason we, we uh, show this with a, a kind of a, a ball instead of like points, because we don't know exactly where any of those points are, but we're pretty sure they're, they're out there. And that's where some of the longer period comets might come from. So very, very far reaches of the outer solar system where they barely be bound to the sun's gravitational pull and then come all the way in and swing around the sun, um, do a quick pass, and then back out into the, the frozen frozen nether reaches of the solar system. So that's, that's the life of a comet. It's like this hot blast for a year or two, and then like several decades of just being frozen. So kind of intense, if you think about it. Um, so I wanted to show... Um, at least one actual comet <laughs> because we've visited comets. Um, we have samples from actual comets in our solar system. And because some of this material is from so far out in the solar system, we think it's from a very early time of the solar system, what we call primordial material. And so it's very exciting for, uh, for planetary scientists to get their hands on that stuff and be able to see like, what the early, early solar system was made of, like before the planets even formed, like stuff that's it's literally older than dirt. So um, I'm gonna switch over to uh, our view of Stellarium um, just to switch out my open spaces. <laughs> so I kind of have this other one queued up. Um, this is the one that I use to make the image, the thumbnail for tonight. Um, so we, uh, we've, uh, we've flown behind a comet, uh, Comet Vilt 2, 
and collected stardust from that. And uh, I think that was actually called the Stardust Mission. <laughs> um, and this doesn't look like the right settings. Um, hmm. Oh, right, that's not the right one. Um, so we actually have Stardust that it was it was sent back to Earth, and it is like in this little capsule of like aerogel, and they purposefully crashed it into the desert. And it's kind of what they're going to be doing, um, I believe, with Osiris Rex. So the data, um, some uh, bits of an asteroid, uh, asteroid Bennu. Um, is being visited by Osiris Rex or has been visited and that we're gonna be uh, getting some samples back from there in a little while um, as in like a couple years and that's also gonna crash into a desert <laughs> and uh, so we'll see we'll see what that looks like okay so <laughs> so here is open space round two um, so this is a, a different profile um, that I opened here and this is the this is from the Rosetta mission. So they have a whole bunch of data from this one mission that went and visited uh, Comet uh, 67P, and I can't pronounce like the name right. Um, so that was the ESA European Space Agency uh, Rosetta mission, and so the the green line here is the the path of the comet. So actually, before I get in close and possibly break something else. Um, I just want to move out um, so you can kind of see where that path is in the solar system. So this was intercepted when it was still pretty far away from the sun, like out um, past the orbit of Mars. So it was on its way in and uh, went around the sun relatively closely. Um, so we'll pop back in here. And I did practice again, like I practiced this yesterday and everything worked great. I was like, oh, this is so awesome. And I you know, I'd made the thumbnail and everything. Um, and then this afternoon, my computer decided it hated me. Um, so I think I want to, uh, so there's this, uh, this view, what you're seeing like this with this box is like the field of view of the instrument on the Rosetta probe. Um, so Rosetta was the, the main spacecraft. And then it sent down, and some of y'all might remember, it sent down, um, uh, an attachment of sorts, <laughs> a little robot Philae uh, that was supposed to land, land on a comet. Like, I hadn't really been, I don't think we'd really done that before. I think um, Hayabusa had hovered near a comet, um, but this was actually landing on a comet and it was supposed to sink in with harpoons. And so there were like a lot of harpoon jokes back in, you know, it was this 2014-ish. So this is kind of the little path that, um, I believe this was the orbit of is that Philae or actually Rosetta itself and then Philae. So Rosetta orbited, yeah, it's, it's complaining at me. Okay, so, <laughs> so it basically went in and orbited around the comet and then the lander Philae went in and it kind of like bounced and got stuck in a crevice. Um, so we actually have beautiful images <laughs> that loaded earlier today. Um, of the comet, but you can still see like just this shape, um, which is pretty cool. I mean, you, you can't really tell the shape of a comet from Earth. Um, you know, it just looks like a like this core. But as this got closer to the sun, so it wouldn't have had a tail when it was this far out from the sun. But yeah, this gray blob here, that's the shape. That's the actual outline of the comet. But for whatever reason, the images of it, of the surface aren't loading. It had this kind of rubber ducky shape, right? So you call this the rubber ducky. So you can see like there's the head of the rubber ducky, there's its neck, there's its body, super cute, just floating through space like rubber duckies do. Um, I mean, it's basically like a, you know, pile of rubble that's, you know, loosely held together by gravity and like some ices. Um, but this far out from the sun, again, it wouldn't have had a tail by the time it, you know, got in closer to the sun. Um, I don't even remember what all happened to Philae. Um, but kind of, kind of a neat thing. So we have landed on a comet. Uh, we've flown behind a comet and collected comet dust, and from those, um, from those amazing comets, um, we've learned more about our early solar system and how the other planets and planetary bodies in our solar system formed. So that was the other comet I wanted to, to just kind of like show y'all this evening. Um, that one, 
I don't, I don't remember when it's coming back. It is a periodic comet, so it comes and goes um, periodically like you do. But if you want to learn more about that comet or the other comets that are visible, I have one more special treat. If I can make it work. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. Okay. Yeah. So um, it was funny because... Um, I, I just did <laughs> a talk for Astronomy on Tap for all y'all's 21 and older over. We're not actually operating in bars these days, but um, we, it's still, it's yeah, recommended 21 and over. Um, but I talked about like various astronomy apps, some of my favorite apps <laughs> in astronomy. And I managed to miss this one because I hadn't gone comet hunting yet. So just in the last few minutes, um, I just want to share an app that I found. So Stellarium is fantastic. Like I was able to, to load the, those two comets into Stellarium so that it'll show me where they're going to be, you know, over the, the rest of the month. Um, I'm not sure how to do that on my phone though. And I'm not going to bring my computer out with me observing. I bring my phone with me because it's more compact. So I did find this app. It's called Comet Book as in notebook or pocket book but it's a book for comets. So Comet Book, uh, which is put out by Vixen. And here's what it looks like on my phone. Nope, went away. <laughs> um, so I gave this two thumbs up. It, it was free download, so I'm not like trying to like make them money or anything. Um, but it was, uh, I just thought it was really great. Basically everything that I would want in an app <laughs> for comets. Uh, the only thing that it doesn't show is like how bright things are gonna be which is understandable because we don't necessarily know in advance how bright they're going to be. Um, but um, let's see. So this is set for July 15th. So if I go around, so there was Comet Lemon, right? So I can scroll through time of day, right? So if I want it, you know, later in the evening. So now this is like 11 o'clock at night. So you see like the 2300 uh, in the upper left corner. Um, and I can also scroll, you know, through which day. So if, you know, I want to know where it is tonight, then there's the day scroller. So I can scroll through the day down to tonight at 11 o'clock. And it gives me, um, below the date there, it gives the altitude and azimuth, uh, which most, if you're familiar with observing, then, um, you know, the, the altitude, that's how high above the horizon it is. So 5.6 degrees is not very high above the horizon. Um, and then the azimuth as well. So you can kind of gauge which direction to look uh, to see it, which is really helpful. Um, and I can kind of look through the book for Neowise also. So if I want to find Neowise, oh, there's Neowise. And that's where it was at four o'clock this morning <laughs> when I was looking for it. So it's about more like 4.30. Uh, so again, I can kind of scroll through the day and say, all right, if I want to get up at four o'clock, you know, and then over the next week, how is it going to move through the sky? Um, so this is really handy because it, you know, fits in your pocket. So I can go through time, scroll through the day. Um, and the other thing that is fabulous is it has that little circle above day and time. And when you click on that, it does show you the three-dimensional view in the solar system of where this thing is. So has it already gone around the sun? Is it going to get brighter? Is it going to get fainter? So this is set again right now for July 17th. Um, if we look back and see where it is today, yeah, it's already, so it's already kind of gone around its closest point to the sun and it's getting further away. Um, you can see it's also showing kind of the, the length, the relative lengths and directions of the, of the, um, comet tails. So always pointing away from the sun, but yeah, you can kind of see, you know, as it goes through the month, it's going to be getting further away, um, possibly fainter and the tail, um, tail will get, um, a bit shorter as it goes. So just a fun thing. Um, again, it's free. It was by Vixen. So the Vixen uh, makes other astronomy equipment if you're familiar with them. And it's called Comet Book. So that's our little tour of comets and not too many not comets. Um, again, I'm Irene Pease here with the Amateur Astronomers Association in New York. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And we hope that you have a fun and safe week and hope to see you back next week.